For years, fast food workers across the United States have rallied for better pay and working conditions. What do we want? 50! When do we want it? Now! If we don't get it, shut it down! If we don't get it, In California last summer, the state legislature listened. The California State Senate advanced a measure that would give more than a half million fast food workers more power and protections. But the law hasn't been instituted yet. The bill would create a new 10-member fast food council that would be empowered to set minimum standards for wages, hours, and working conditions in California. The fast food industry gathered enough signatures to put a statewide ballot initiative on the 2024 ballot in the hopes of overturning it. Californians have a unique style of democracy for most other U.S. states in that if someone gathers enough signatures, they can put anything, and I mean anything, to a statewide vote and make it a law if it passes. It's led to good and bad things over the past century. But in recent years, major corporations have used the ballot initiative to basically throw an election day tantrum. I'm Gustavo Arellano. You're listening to The Times, Essential News from the LA Times. It's Wednesday, March 8th, 2023. Today, the political fight over fast food workers in California and what it says about the future of California's proposition system. Here to talk about all this is my LA Times colleague, business reporter Suhana Hussein. Suhana, welcome to the Times. Thanks for having me. So this fast food worker bill at the center of the controversy, what's the story behind it and what exactly did advocates say it would do? Right. So the union SCIU, so the Service Employees International Union, uh, they have been assisting fast food workers with their campaign to get higher wages. And the bill, AB 257, would create a council of worker representatives, um, government representatives, and franchise fast food company representatives to set wages and working conditions for workers in the fast food industry. So this um, representative body would have had the authority to raise their wages as high as $22 an hour this year in 2023. Wow. That doesn't mean that they would necessarily have done that, but that is the upper limit of what AB 257 would have allowed them to do. And the bill, the first time it went through the legislature, it didn't make it through. On a second pass, it did, but you have a certain amount of time after the legislature passes a law where if you gather enough support, you can halt the law and put the question to California voters as a proposition, as a voter initiative, so voters can vote it up or vote it down. So basically, the fast food industry, this coalition of trade groups and corporations came together and put millions of dollars into a referendum campaign to stop AB 257 from happening. Um, opponents of the law said that it would raise labor costs too high and put a lot of restaurants out of business. And they had a study that claimed fast food prices would rise 20% if this bill went into effect. Where did they get that figure from? Is that how much wages would rise? Well. It is true that food prices would rise. We just don't know that it would rise as much as 20%. But there's a whole other conversation we could have about the research that they put together on that. So there's this research center at UC Riverside that does a lot of industry-funded reports. Um, they've been used by Lyft and Uber when they funded a ballot proposition to carve out a California labor law in a way that worked with their business model. And we saw that with Prop 22. In California, ride share as we know it is at risk. According to an independent study, if drivers are forced to become employees, there will be far fewer drivers on the road. So rides may take twice as long to get to you. Prices could increase 25 to 100 percent and even worse. The fast food industry also used this research center and recently uh, professors throughout the UC system have 
raise issues with this research center. It turns out that the center is not run by a faculty member who like teaches classes at UC Riverside. It's run by an independent consulting firm, uh, Beacon Economics. Um, Riverside gets royalty payments for the reports that this firm puts out bearing the UC Riverside brandings. After the break, a second look at the research study at the heart of the campaign to stop AB257. Suhana, you mentioned a study at UC Riverside that these fast food coalitions have been citing in their campaigns, but it raises some concerns for professors at UC Riverside. What's their issue with it? Right. So professors told me that they felt like it was basically this random company like licensing a public university's logo and stamping it on research that they felt was not up to par and it was being used to attack state labor laws in a way they disagreed with. And uh, the firm Beacon Economics came back and were like, everything about this was sanctioned by the university and we disclose who uh, funds the reports and the people who are coming after us just disagree with us ideologically. So this coalition of fast food industry groups just followed Uber and Lyft and funded a study that they cited for their arguments against a bill that would be against their interests. And when it passed anyway, this bill, the fast food groups just went with Plan B, which is start a referendum campaign. Yeah, pretty much as soon as AB 257 was signed by the governor, within a day or two, they had launched this campaign. The biggest issues is AB 257. It is no doubt one of the most far reaching and damaging proposals the restaurant community has seen in decades. They spent millions of dollars on this campaign in the fall. AB 257 essentially establishes a fourth branch of government to set statewide policy for one segment of employers. Its precedent and reach are irresponsible. This is something that was top of mind for over 40 business groups, local chambers of commerce, and partners like the International Franchise Association and the National Restaurant Association, who also worked incredibly hard in attempts to stop this proposal. And so they had until December 5th to submit about 623,000 California voter signatures to the state. And they ended up submitting more than 1 million signatures, of which more than 700,000 were deemed to be valid. And so the law is now on hold. So now the voters will have their say in November of next year. Yeah, it's been an interesting discussion and political process and part of this larger conversation about how businesses have been using statewide voter initiatives to create state labor law or to change state labor laws. Coming up after the break, the murky world in which people collect signatures for ballot measures in California. So, Suana, the fast food industry thinks it could overturn a liberal law in blue, blue, blue California. That's not really surprising. I mean, California voters have also rejected affirmative action and gay marriage in just the past 15 years. So there's always this weird, like, dichotomy with California and its democracy. So what was it about how the fast food industry gathered signatures so fast to fight this council that made you want to investigate? So... The union that had backed AB 257 filed a complaint with California officials saying that they were hearing reports that the campaign was violating state election rules and misrepresenting the ballot initiative to voters. So once they filed that complaint, I wrote a story about it and I started hearing actually from a few people um, who said that this had happened to them. One of the people I spoke to was Dan Killam. He was in San Francisco when he came across a signature gatherer. Their clipboard was almost full with signatures. 
They were getting a lot of takers because, I don't know, I, I mean, a lot of people support restaurant workers around here, you know? I know I do. He thought he was actually signing a petition that would help to raise wages for fast food workers. They said explicitly that it was about raising restaurant worker wages. That's what they said. I mean, I agree with that, and so I, I agreed to sign it. But in fact, he was actually signing a petition that aimed to get rid of the law that would have done exactly that. But I'm worried I unknowingly undermined them by signing this thing. I'm a pretty politically active person, and I read the news pretty obsessively, and I got fooled. If I can get fooled, who knows who else is getting tricked. It's disturbing to me, and if I sign any petitions in the future. I know I'm going to be reading the fine print. So I spoke also to a few people who had sort of interactions with signature gatherers who were pretty aggressive. Emily Pothast and her partner came across people who they felt were misrepresenting the AB257 referendum campaign to people at the Oakland Farmers Market. And she tried to sort of engage with the signature gatherer and like point out the text of the petition and see what they thought and if they knew what it, exactly it was that they were actually selling to people. And she said once when she was speaking to an elderly man who was collecting signatures, a woman came over who appeared to be a supervisor and started yelling at her. And it was just kind of like a nasty situation from her perspective. Are there laws in place to prevent voters signing up for something that they're not really clear about or maybe have regrets about later on? Yeah, so there are laws that make it a misdemeanor to misrepresent a ballot initiative to voters. It's just it's difficult to enforce and courts have generally been pretty hands off and if you did want to enforce it, it's also really hard because of all the layers in the chain, like the campaign hires another firm, which hires a bunch of other firms, which hire contractors. It is hard to sort of know who did what. And um, so it's just there aren't very many consequences for doing this. And we're seeing this more in recent years. But has there been any blowback over the signature gathering for the Fast Food Council ballot initiative? Yeah, people talking about it on social media. And I think um, some people did file uh, complaints with our California election complaint portal. Um, and then there are our transparency advocates who are really trying to think of ways to make this process serve voters a bit better so that they know what they're signing. For example, one of the things that you'll probably see in May this year, if you're approached by someone who's collecting signatures for something is, is supposed to now have a line under um, where each signature is going to go that pretty much tells you, make sure you read <laughs> what this petition is going to do. I can't remember the exact wording right now, but You'll have to see that when you sign. Um, it really does put it on the voter for sure. It's not changing anything about who the signature gatherer is actually beholden to or the training for them or anything like that. The courts are reluctant to make it extremely difficult to collect signatures. But if you look at it like gathering signatures to put something on the ballot is an extension of free political speech. You don't want to make it super difficult to gather signatures. There was a press conference held at the end of last year called by SEIU, the union that backed AB 257, and the transparency advocates on, on the call said that they were looking to find ways to help this be less of an issue. One of the things that they're considering pushing is having a portion of signatures that need to be collected by people who are not paid. Uh, one of the things that comes up with signature gatherers is that they are incentivized to say whatever needs to be said to get a signature is because they are paid per signature. It could be even like $10 a signature. So while it's not really currently possible to get rid of paid signature gathering, they are exploring the possibility of at least making sure that some portion of those signatures has to come from grassroots support so is collected by volunteers rather than paid signature gatherers. Yeah, after reading your story and just talking to you, I just don't know how this is going to be fixed because people are always in a rush. Like you put a petition in front of them and say, hey, it's going to be for this. Can you sign it? 
and either you ignore them completely or you like what someone says and you just say, okay, I'll sign it. But it's always hard to make people just pay attention. So I hope that, especially after this, that maybe something will happen to fix this issue. So this doesn't happen as often as it currently seems to happen. Right. That's a really good point. Um, we all know what it's like to run in to do an errand at a grocery store and you're approached by someone who's collecting signatures for something is for me, like writing about this, one of the things I'm hoping people will take away is that they should, you know, pay attention to what they're signing, read the petition. Maybe this is at least will work on an individual level. There is a long history of wealthy and powerful groups manipulating systems to their benefit. So I think that's probably nothing new. I do think the California ballot initiative system is known to be um, especially <laughs> gameable. Yeah. And we have so many things to vote on every cycle, it feels like. And one thing to note is you have to get so many signatures and the time frame to gather signatures for a referendum is pretty short. But if you have enough money, experts will say you can qualify anything for the California ballot. I think that's why it's an increasingly popular option. So obviously the companies want voters to pass their propositions, but even if they fail, well, it's kind of an investment for them to do this in the first place. It's definitely an investment. This coalition raised more than 13 million in support of their campaign as of December. So it's not cheap. It takes a lot of money. But the thing is, is even if they're ultimately like unsuccessful in their campaign on the ballot, They've still managed to put off this law for two years. And probably the way they see it is they've saved money not implementing the law. These laws would have gone into effect in January of this year. But because these campaigns passed, now they have two more years to not have to deal with it. Suhana, thank you so much for this conversation. Thanks so much for having me. And that's it for this episode of The Times, essential news from the LA Times. Nicholas Perez and Denise Guerra were the jefes on this episode. It was edited by Hasmin Aguilera and Mike Kaplan mixed and mastered it. Our show is produced by Denise Guerra, Contra Brasali, and David Toledo, and Ashley Brown. Our editorial assistants are Roberto Reyes and Nicholas Perez. Our fellow is Helen Lee. Our engineers are Mario Diaz, Mark Nieto, and Mike Heflin. Our executive producers are Hasmin Aguilera, Shani Hilton, and Hiba El Orbani. And our theme music is by Andrew Eben. I'm Gustavo Ariano. We'll be back Friday with all the news and the smile. Gracias.